six years ago, I was given five years to live. That was a bit of a stunner. All I had was a back pain. The doctors asked me to do a few tests and a few more tests after that. And finally, they gave me the grim news. They said, you have a type of blood cancer, which is called multiple myeloma. It has no cure. It's definitely treatable. Here I was wondering. I lived a very healthy lifestyle. I don't smoke. I drink moderately. I could out-track, out-walk guys half my age. And I did not understand, why me? Then I thought maybe it was the food that I had been eating. Or was it due to the uh, agricultural situation we had in the country? Before we get to the end of that mystery, let me just give you a quick, a few facts about where as a, as, a, as, a, as a whole planet we are headed. There are more people alive today on this earth than have ever been born before. Now dovetail that in with the figure that 40% of us are going to be water deficient. 40% of us will have less water than we have today by the year 2030. And are you aware that we waste 1.3 billion tons, that's B, billion tons of food every year? And that's the current situation, right? So that's what's going to happen. And currently we waste that much. We put so many fungicides, weedy sides, uh, pesticides, anything with a side that we can think of, we put on our plants. Uh, Lucknow University did an interesting yes. study. A few years back, Lucknow University did a study and they found traces of insecticide even in mother's milk. But isn't that the first thing we give our kids? And let's do a quick thing. How many of you love eating dhaniya pudinas, the lettuces, yummy tasty stuff, right? You know where they're all grown? So let's give you an example of Delhi. So all your tasty palak, dhaniya pudina, all your green veggies, they are grown along the banks of the Yamuna. You know what else happens on the banks of the Yamuna every day from about 5.30 to 8.30 in the morning? <laughs> exactly. We are biologically contaminating the very thing we are eating. And no matter how much you wash it, how much of those RO plants, waters that you wash it with, it doesn't go. It sticks. So we had to start growing ourselves. We have, gee, but how do we grow it? Because everything is polluted today. The land is polluted. The air is polluted. The water is polluted. What do you do? You have to find out some sort of a system where you can grow your own food. We thought we'll first eat organic. And this is, real, this is something which we should all think about. So when we go and someone tells us, Ji, Mirata, we've got an organic field. And we're like, wow, this is great. He's got three acres of organic field in the middle of a complex where on his right hand side, someone is spraying DDT. On his left hand side, someone is spraying melatine. But our field is organic. It doesn't work that way again. We really don't have any organic fields close to our cities. We don't have them. But yet we need to eat clean food. Now, whenever we face with such astounding odds, my thought always goes towards this very grainy picture of this smiling little girl. So in, uh, in summers, so you have a lot of kids sitting here. So in, in winters, the boys wear double-breasted coats, and the girls wear single-breasted coats to school. Unfortunately for this girl, she had a brother who was five years elder to her, me. And I would wear my double-breasted coats to school. And my mother, you know, times were hard. Uh, those were tough days for everybody. And my mother just could not bear to throw away my old jackets. I had no cousins. What she would do is she would use the only things at her disposal. So she would use all her ingenuity. She would use a cheap local tailor and would capitalize on the complete lack of fashion sense that my sister had, absolutely zero and she would cut my blazer up and make it into a single-breasted jacket for her. This was the first memory I have of making things work. And we made things work. Where, you know, we're standing in lines to buy tickets, ordering food, getting a passport, getting an electricity connection. We just made things work. It just happened. Later on, we realized, or I realized, that this ingenuity in action, Punjabis had a name for it, and we called it Jugaad. Jukar, this ingenuity in action, basically has three pillars. The first one 
it should be local and innovative. The second one, it should be easy to learn and operate. And lastly, it has to cost pesas to the rupee. Now that was the situation we faced with. We had a life changing situation which occurred with us and we decided that we had to do something about it. Now back to growing food. So we've spoken about how we had an issue, we found to guard, now we gotta grow our own food. How did we start that? Land. What land? We had no land. You have no land? No. What am I gonna tire on that? Don't worry. Anyway, now there was, the land was bad. Whatever land was available was virtually impossible to buy. Sky high prices. The air was polluted and water was in a very, very bad shape, the, the, the ground water. No, why don't we just put up two of those RO plants? I tell you what, let's put 10 RO plants and we'll just use those RO water for our follow -up. Sorry, there's a catch here. For normal farming, we consume about 14 liters of water for one head of lettuce, 12 liters of water for one tomato, and 18 liters of water to grow one head of broccoli. Do the max yourself. Wow, and if you eat inorganic food, this is what happens to your body, what's happened to our slide here. But, you know, it's really, really, really not possible to have that much clean water produced on site. And how do we store our food? We are growing in the fields, we are growing in the farms, and we need to get our food to where we stay. We don't eat in those farms which are hundreds of kilometers away. So how do we get our food from there to where we are today? How do we get food here? So this is really, really sad. Everybody just go eat ice cream, right? So we have terrible food growing. Even if we manage to grow it well, we transport it so badly that by the time it gets here, it's just unnutritious paper. And doesn't the doctor tell us, keep palak khao, have more this, have more green leafies, have saag. But what if we are poisoning ourselves by having these very things? And that didn't work out for us. You know, whenever we're faced with such odds that just don't make sense, again, my thought goes back to how my mother made those wonderful blazers for her. We had to do something. After a while, we realized that probably the solution was lying in our balcony. Whilst I was in Singapore, I picked up a hydroponic kit which grew eight plants. This was something I was planning for my retirement as a fun hobby, which I would follow later. But now we come to the tragic bit. Eight plants. If you can grow eight plants, why can't you grow 8,000? I mean, why can't you grow 8 million? If you can grow eight plants in your balcony, you can grow a lot, right? So why couldn't we do that? So then we decided, okay, we're going to use hydroponics to do the needful. Now, before we go any further, let me quickly give you a two-second intro on hydroponics. I won't make this very boring. Hydroponics is the science of growing food without any soil. It's really weird, isn't it? So you think about it. When you're in a school, what are the couple of things you need to grow food? You need air, you need water, you need nutrition. There's, you need sun, you need light. There's no soil. Did you ever need soil? You didn't. But yet we grow in soil because it was the easiest thing to do and it was something we were doing for centuries. So we said we are going to grow high tech, we are going to grow without soil, and we are going to use this technology of hydroponics. But is it very easy to grow hydroponics? No, it is, because if you, if you look at it, the first example of large-scale hydroponic system was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which was one of the seven wonders of the old world. Now, for us to grow hydroponically, you need three components. You need a net pot. Firstly, you need a container. We were starting, we used the heat tins, paint tins, we used all sorts of stuff to grow stuff in. I mean, people are getting scared when we're going to the houses and saying, sir, aapke garage mein koi dahi ke dabbe hain. They're like wondering what these guys are doing, collecting all our dahi dabbas. But we did that. We wanted to make this, this science really, really inexpensive. Now, when he decided to grow large scale, the first thing I did was I went to one of these websites and I saw exactly how much it costs to import these equipments into India. And I said, you know, I'll just import everything and we'll grow everything at home. That decision lasted for about 20 minutes because that's the time it takes to open the laptop, type alibaba.com and try figuring out what the prices are. They are so expensive. So I want to eat healthy, but even I'm not going to eat a 80 rupee tomato, right? It just doesn't make sense. So we've got to get the cost down. We've got to do something intelligent to get the cost down. 
and sometimes intelligence and beauty kind of don't go hand in hand. So we'll talk about that. So we started with growing with dahi tins, those paint buckets that he modified to grow tomatoes in. We made our own uh, uh, versions of Dutch buckets. This is another way to make a bucket. We made our own Indian versions of Dutch buckets. We fabricated everything ourselves. And, and in the end, I think we said that we're not going to do all this because it's going to be very difficult for you to get a dahi tin. So we stuck to this. We decided on food grade PVC pipes. And you know why food grade? This is, in, this is really cool because it has no patent. We have no patent. There is no intellectual property. We are probably the worst salesman in the world because we are trying to tell you that we don't want to patent any of this. It doesn't make sense. These are all open source. You can do it and I can do it. It's a pipe with holes in it. And we want, so we've put these designs on our website so that everyone can grow just by copying what we've done. We, this is the PVC pipe that we're talking about. And we started with growing in this. And uh, 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 in the end, we felt that because this is so widely available, this is the right thing to do our experiments in. Now, these PVC pipes are which hold the water. And uh, what we do is we have these net cups. And the net cups are there to hold the plant. And inside the net cups, you can use any inert medium. Perlite, vermiculite, coco peat, leca balls, there are many of them. So leca balls is basically expanded clay, right? Uh, uh, so before that, let me just show you these net pots. So the ones on the left, the glass is what we initially started using. We just went, literally went and bought really bad quality plastic glasses, drilled holes in them and started using these. Then when we started modernizing it and set up our test farm, we molded the ones on the right, which we do ourselves. This is the interesting part. So the thing on the old, which you see, are the Leka balls we imported from, from Europe. Now those cost us a lot of money. I spent a huge part of my children's college fund on buying those. After doing that for a couple of, uh, a couple of cycles, we realized that we had to get them cheap. I mean, if we were gonna grow these on a large scale in India and present this as a solution for the Indian farmer, we have to make them cheap. So we called up Jagar Bhai in Gujarat and said we need these clay balls and he said they are round clay balls and he sent them to me and he sent something like that, which is over there. And I called him up and I said, Jigarbhai, this doesn't look round to me. He said, it's round. Many guy doesn't look round to me. He said, this is round. So I said, I am telling you. He said, sir, it costs only 20% of the last one. I said, ha, huh, it looks round to me now. Yes. <laughs> yes, looking round. Yeah. So our idea was to just bring things as cheaply, just bring down the cost so that every one of us, each and every one of us could afford it. Not just the two or three or 10% of our population but the bulk of our populace, which lives not here, but far away from these cities. And we come to the, the last bit, the third part is, how do you feed your plants? You have to feed your plants what they normally take from soil, nutrients. So we feed them nutrients externally. Now these nutrients are very, very expensive. We again got imported nutrients from Holland. It didn't work out, it was expensive. Then finally we decided, let's do it on our own, let's try it. And we started experimenting. And finally, I would say now that we are more or less, we make our own nutrients. We save 70% of the money we would have otherwise spent on this. And most importantly, now we are making it in bulk for our own use and for retail. People told us, don't, don't get into nutrient business. Plant, lagaoge, ye karoge, wo karoge. Well, the plant is above my bedroom in the house right now. So I don't care, but we are still doing it. And it works. So these nutrients that we make at home on our own, two of us, which have zero agricultural experience between us, we still manage to make it work. Now, before we end, we'll show you a couple of things. Now, everyone grows lettuces at home. They grow cabbages, they grow parsley and kale, which we are showing here. What we also grow, we grow olive trees. We grow papaya trees. We grow mulberry trees. We grow anar de ped. We grow avocados and we grow aloe vera and we grow cactuses. And we do this all on our roof of our, of our home. And and we do it, we do it keeping in mind that I'm gonna live in that house for the next 30 years, so we don't have to stress the roof too much. And yet we manage to grow all this. We have a home composter, so we made a zero waste system where all the waste that comes from these papaya and mulberry trees, we put it into the home composter, put in five kgs of earthworms, and we get our own compost brew, which we again put in our nutrients to make our food. So we are trying to create these very local, very urban, low cost systems. In the end, I think what the kind of message we want to tell you is 
that all of us, we don't have to eat poisonous food. There is no trade-off in feeding an over-expanding massive population and clean ethical food. They are not exclusive. There is no premium on good food in this country. For our population, there is no premium at all. So eating bad food and wearing fancy clothes is like standing on a weighing scale and sucking your stomach in. It doesn't, it make, might make you look good, it doesn't do anything for the weight, right? So let's concentrate on things which make a difference and let's try putting a collective effort on it. Thank, Thank you. you.